Hey folks, in this episode of This Week in Photo, it's all about Lumix. This is Twip. Hey, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I'm your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today, we're gonna be talking about a camera brand that's near and dear to my heart, personally, and both of my guests, um, and that's Lumix. It's a camera, it's the brand that I shoot. I, I My daily driver is the Lumix G9, and I love that camera. I think the first week I had it, it was on the pillow next to me. You know, much to the chagrin <laughs> of the other person. In the, but, <laughs> but I love that camera, it's amazing. Uh, but the other two guys on the show, Shiv Burma and Don Komarechka, are also in the Lumix family. And uh, we're going to talk about, it's not going to be a, a, you know, a Lumix love fest, but what I want to talk about is uh, just some of the new things that are coming out, full frame, etc., new lenses, adapters, etc. But also, I want to expand it out to the greater world of the mirrorless, full frame specifically, and the changes that we've seen over the last year. So let's let's dive right in. Let's start with the introduction. Shiv Verma, you're on the show. You've been on the show. It's been a while. You know, I was looking. Not not yeah, not that long, but long. But yeah, long too long. Yeah, yeah. I say too yeah. long. But uh, no, it's good to good to be back. Good it is to be good back to have you back. What what have you been working on, man? What's uh, what's going well, on? With Shiv Verma? Uh, just just finished with uh, Photo Plus Expo and. Uh, getting ready for another long uh, week over at the Crane Festival in Bosque, mm -hmm. which is uh, in about 10 days. So, uh, yeah, that's that's going to be the last big one for the year. And then i uh, got a couple of trips lined up for next year, apart from the shows in Florida. Um, I'm going to do Vietnam that you never did, so. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, so, you know, I love it. Shiv, I love having you on the show. You know why? Because, like I always say, you are the adult voice of the show, but you have the coolest accent. You should read audiobooks. I'm telling you. <laughs> it's awesome. I second that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but, but, but to be honest with you, Frederick, uh, you should come along for Vietnam. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, let's talk after the show because, yes. you know, Vietnam is, Vietnam is near and dear to my heart. I, uh, it's been a while. I need to get back to that. To that yeah, level. I was trying to convince uh, Tom Curley to to do the same, but he said he's already done it, and so he, he doesn't want to do it again. But I think it's worth doing it. Like, like you, you've seen everything there is to see on an in, entire country. Come on, no, <laughs> no, no never, never. Well, also on the show, Don Komarechka is here. What's got, what's going on, Don? Our neighbor up to the north. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, winter is coming, and so I'm preparing for my snowflake photography stuff, and and so that's big. But uh, funny enough, a year ago, about a year ago, I um, I had somebody tip me off that, uh, and this is my weird mad scientist photography, that uh, South African succulents, they will fluoresce. The flowers of those plants will fluoresce beautifully in ultraviolet light and glow into magical colors. So I bought some. And now finally they are blossoming uh, a year later. And so that is an investment in time and effort. And uh, I posted a photo of one of them recently and I've got another one that's about to bloom too. And so that's just, I go down all these strange rabbit holes. Today I was also trying to hack my red hydrogen camera to put my 3D images on it because they haven't released any software for that. And I was successful in doing so uh, in a sense. So I like to tinker. I like to, to uh, you know, toil away in obscurity and eventually come up with something interesting. You know what? I, I I think you should yeah. I think you should embrace your persona and when you come on this week in photo you should always just wear like a lab coat and just <laughs> <laughs> and maybe have some beakers and some water some colored water boiling in the background or something <laughs> No, and, and oh, now it's he, gonna now, happen. Now he the can next have time. a glowing, uh, a glowing protea uh, sitting in front of him, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> lighting up his face. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, welcome, Don. And Don, before we before we dive in, um, you're running a podcast now. When you and I talked briefly a couple of days ago, uh, it's going pretty well. Give us a, a you know a ten second snippet of what's going on with your show. Oh, I'd love to. The elevator pitch is Photo Geek Weekly at photogeekweekly.com. It uh, we we try to find the geekiest, most technical news stories in the photographic industry on a weekly basis, and uh, me and a guest host discuss them, pull them apart, and find everything under the hood uh, that might not be easily discussable if you're just scratching the surface. So the last episode that we put out yesterday uh, was with Andy Anatko, and he is a wonderful, whimsically wise individual in the technology industry, and we had a great discussion. Uh, I always have great hosts. Uh, 
uh, on there uh, with me to just totally geek out about photography. Love it. Love it. Well, cool. Well, it's good to have you away from your show and back onto This Week in Photo for a little bit. So Yeah, clean rooms and bunny suits. <laughs> clean rooms and bunny suits. <laughs> yes. That's what you should have named your show. Clean rooms and bunny, shoe, bunny suits and the occasional lens and camera. Love exactly. It. <laughs> cool. All right, guys. Well, speaking of lenses and cameras, let's dive into the topic du jour of this episode of This Week in Photo, and that is Lumix and the greater sort of ecosystem that's growing around mirrorless and the fervor around mirrorless. Um, let, let's start with um, – and Shiv, I'll throw it to you first. I know you were, you were speaking – or you were in the in one of the booths. You were at the uh, the Hunts Photo Booth, right? In right. Photo Plus right. Expo. Mm -hmm. So you're familiar with the lineup. Both of you guys are all of or all of us are familiar with the new lineup. But why don't you take us through some of the the cool things from your perspective for your genre of photography that Panasonic and Lumix are doing with their new offerings, i.e., full frame. So I mean, I think. There's a transition from where Panasonic is right now to where they're going, and uh, you know, first of all, I think I think we need to dispel uh, any rumors that uh, have been floating around, and one of them being, oh, maybe now mirrorless uh, cameras and the micro four thirds world is dead. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, I, I think you know people need to understand that folks like Canon and Nikon have had fundamentally two formats, I mean, the APS-C and then the full frame. Uh, the only distinction or sort of advantage they probably had between them is the fact that their lenses were compatible with both formats. So the same lens can be used on either camera. Whereas with the micro four thirds, the uh, size of the opening uh, you know, it doesn't allow for the same lens to basically work on both systems. So you, know, you come out with a new um, larger opening. And what's nice with Panasonic and what they've done is that rather than try and invent another brand new um, you know, lens mount system to have adopted what Leica has already created. And the relationship with Leica, which has been, you know, there from the very beginning, uh, has, has sort of structured a format that has lenses already out there. I mean, people say, oh, Panasonic's going to be coming out with three lenses. Yes, they're going to be three Lumix lenses, but that's not to preclude all the Leica L series lenses that are already out there. Sure. And then unlike what happened originally when Micro Four Thirds came out and people started making adapters, uh, there are a ton of adapters already available for the L mount system that adapt a plethora of lenses. And then you've got, you know, another sort of clearly the company may be going under as they say, but uh, the, the the Mayor Golitz company, which makes a number of lenses, very interesting lenses, uh, you know, they have a series of L mounts, and then you've got a company called Handle Vision. They've got a series of L mounts. Mm -hmm. So there is no dearth of L mount lenses. So yeah. you know, let's yeah, put that and, and that and I want to dive into that because there was there was a discussion um, that you guys mentioned that Tony Northrup on on their the Tony and, and Chelsea Northrup. Ahead of well, actually, work. Chelsea was Ch Chelsea was uh, not doing so well that day, so Tony did it on his own. By himself. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so I haven't watched it yet, but you got you guys. Were the sanity sort of, check was missing. It was sort of the uh, <laughs> the it was it was painting a picture that Micro Four Thirds is dying because Panasonic doesn't have the horsepower to to push two distinct camera systems. Don Don Komarechka is. From your perspective, I mean, I know you're not inside Panasonic and you're not looking in their their checkbook, but uh, what what do you think? I mean, can can both of these systems, the Micro Four Thirds and full frame architectures, be supported by Panasonic successfully? Well, could other manufacturers have two different sensor sizes and be successful? Yeah, just look at every other camera manufacturer, and they are being <laughs> successful within that. So yeah. I, I don't think that that's, that's a divide. In fact, I, the divide between a very small sensor, micro four thirds, and a full frame camera and having distinct systems is actually an advantage because – 
you don't have as much of an overlap. If you want to get a micro four thirds camera, uh, I use mine a lot for travel photography because it's lightweight and all of the lenses are noticeably smaller. Um, but for macro photography as well, uh, which is right in my wheelhouse, the smaller sensor on a one to one macro lens gives me about twice the magnification compared to a sensor twice the size. Mm. Um, and so there's a lot of advantages of that smaller system that you cannot replace when you go to a larger platform. The larger platform platform has its own advantages. And I've been a, a full frame camera shooter for many years and I know those well. Um, but from a consumer standpoint, Panasonic will have the muscle to put forward so long as there's demand on each platforms. And regardless of Panasonic's involvement, if you look at the industry as a whole, there has always been significant demand for micro four thirds and significant demand for full frame mirrorless cameras. Um, one does not cannibalize the other. So long as the uh, the, the the company is successful, the, the, the sales are there, which all of the, the history of the industry in the last decade or so has shown us. Yeah. Uh, uh, then yeah, there's no issue. There's it, it's it's not a question. But but in in the minds of of consumers that aren't as sort of plugged into the ecosystems or the industry as we three are, you know, they're look at you know your your mind or our minds tend to sort of categorize things like what's from least or 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 not as good to best, right? So on the not as good side, you might say, well, you know, they introduced this new thing. It's full frame. Clearly it's better. It's more pixels. It's bigger and uh, presumably better low light performance and, and all that. So shouldn't I be getting the best of the best or on the micro four third side, should I get something down there? And it's a smaller sensor, albeit, you know, more flexible. Shiver, how do you, how do you answer that? If, if someone walks up to you and they say, you know, which camera should I buy? I want to. I heard Lumix is great. Which one should I get? How do you, How do you answer? Uh, the, the The question is very simple. The you ask, what is it that you want to shoot? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it, it, Don Don said it right. I mean, there, there is a place for both cameras. In fact, there is a place for multiple cameras. You've got micro four thirds. You've got APS-C. You've got full frame. You've got medium format. They all have a place in the industry. It's all based upon what it is that you want to do with your camera. Um, you know, clearly, if if there is a full frame camera, and if I was to look at the reason why I went to Micro Four Thirds was to go smaller, become more nimble, become more, uh, you know, flexible in the way I did things in nature and wildlife. So for nature and wildlife, I'm not necessarily going to use a full frame camera with large lenses. That's what I went away from. Yeah. So there is a place for Micro Four Thirds and all the phenomenal lenses that Panasonic has for me to do what I want to do. Now, I have another, you know, sort of, thing which I photograph, which is landscapes. Mm -hmm. uh, landscapes don't require me to be nimble. I mean, I can go places, carry my car, unless I'm trekking a lot, which I don't, I'm too old to do that kind of stuff. So for that work, I will take a full frame camera. So there is a place for each of those cameras. Now, as far as my commercial work is concerned, I've always been struggling with, you know, how much can I do with a micro four third sensor because of its size? Uh, well, that, that issue now is resolved. I mean, there's going to be a Panasonic full frame camera that I can use to do that work. So, you know, why do photographers use medium format? Well, because it has resolution and uh, it's for product photography and it's for you know, portraiture, etc. Well, there's a camera too. So I think as long as Panasonic stays ahead of the curve, stays with the kind of product that the market demands, uh, there's no reason for them not to be successful in full frame and to keep the micro four thirds form factor alive. Yeah, yeah, and, and hopefully to keep innovating on that. So, oh, so absolutely, absolutely. Don, Don Komarecki, I'm going to throw it to you. So the, the lineup, the new, the new things that are coming out from Panasonic that you can talk about, right? So there's, there's new, the, new, the new series of full-frame cameras and lenses. Which in the lineup has you most excited? And, or you can run through the whole thing if you want. 
Well, if I were to look through my uh, my Lightroom catalog and, and sort it out by metadata, what lenses I would use the most often, the 24 to 105 focal range is by far the number one lens that I would use um, for everyday uh, purposes. And so um, that is definitely a lens that I'm going to be getting day one whenever I can get my hands on it, uh, because it is a very flexible focal range. But Beyond that, I mean, I, I'm getting into uh, more video work for certain projects, and you know, we don't know the, the full specs. Uh, you know, as people are working on firmware behind the scenes to to make these products the best as they could possibly be. But um, I look at what's coming, not just from Panasonic, but also they partnered, of course, with Sigma. So all of the Sigma uh, lenses designed for full frame mirrorless cameras are going to be available at some point in the very near future for the L mount. And of course, Leica has their lenses; they might be a bit out of my price range, um, but they would work just fine too. The beauty, I think, though, is that this uh, uh, L-Mount Alliance, or whatever word that they want to use to call it between the three companies, means that they can all produce cameras on this platform as well. And they're all going to be marketing on this platform because they are putting all of their eggs into that basket. I mean, everybody has their different platforms. Of course, uh, Leica has their uh, M-Series range finders, and Panasonic has Micro Four Thirds, etc. But everybody's compiling everything into this one thing for a big push. If you wanted to buy a Sigma Foveon full-frame sensor, that's going to be an L mount camera and you're going to get glass for that. And if you wanted to jump over and say, let's you know, dip my toes in the water on a Panasonic uh, S series camera, I can do that. All of my glass is compatible. And so much in the same way that an Olympus lens can be used on a Panasonic Micro Four Thirds camera, there's going to be a certain synergy, I think, with the, uh, within this environment that we won't see with any other full-frame mirrorless camera on the market. Because Nikon and Canon, they don't talk to each other, and they certainly are not going to be buddying up to Sony uh, any point soon. So I, I think that this brings a lot of momentum to the race. And that's needed because uh, the race has been going for a while. You know, Sony yeah. has been kind of the only party moving forward. And you you bring up a, a good point, and that's a good a good phrase to put on this race, right? So mm -hmm. it's a race between all of these camera manufacturers, and it seems like it's been heating up this year. I mean, it's at the melting point in you know some ways this year with all yeah, like yeah. Nikon and Sony and you know all these different companies, Fuji, like everyone is in this. So. The, the, and the question becomes for, you know, looking at it through the Lumix lens is can Panasonic compete in this in this landscape with the forward momentum that Sony has with the irrational exuberance that I call it of the Fuji customer base with the, you know, the people that love their Olympus cameras with the Nikon, you know, that came in with the new Z series cameras that sort of stave the bleeding of people leaving Nikon and moving to Sony and whatever Canon's doing, you know, all this, there's a lot of, there's a lot of chum in the water right now. So Shiv, can, can Panasonic like navigate that chum and still, still survive? Yeah. I mean, go back, go back before mirrorless 35 millimeter. Mm -hmm. How many manufacturers were there in that world? Right. I mean, you had, Sony, you had Olympus, you had uh, Leica, you had uh, Konica, Minolta, the, you name it, they were all there. They all survived. Yeah. It's when mirrorless became very much the, uh, the forefront of the camera industry did some of those companies start, you know, their merry death, as I call it. Yeah. But I mean, even a company like Minolta had so much beautiful technology in their lens world that when Sony bought them out, I think Sony's success in their lenses and their G Master series lenses is based upon the fact that they were able to acquire the technology from Minolta. So you know, th there was a place for them all. I think the, 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 the issue that we're wrestling with today is will everybody be able to keep up with what Sony has done or come close enough to what they've been able to produce or actually leapfrog them? Mm -hmm. Now, clearly, we've seen that uh, Nikon and Canon, with their announcements, have not done anything to leapfrog Sony. Sony hasn't had and the need for even an iota of a response to these two announcements. And they're, they're sitting pretty. I mean, their their cameras they know are far superior to what has been produced, and they will sit happily till they need to come up with something else, hence no announcements. 
Yeah. Panasonic, on the other hand, has some, done something really phenomenal with the S series. I mean, there's a lot more in that camera, uh, even with the minimal announcement that you know they've come up with. I mean, the, the kind of responsiveness they have to image stabilization, dual IS. Nobody has dual IS like Panasonic does. Yeah. And if they implement that on the full frame, which they have said they will, uh, that's going to blow away the the competition as far as image stabilization is concerned. You've got, you know, um, 4K 60p. Who's got that? And the fact that it's now a larger you know, format, you've got more body space, hence you've got more heat dissipation capability. So they're not going to have the same issues that Sony had when they came up with, you know, 4K on their cameras. So it's it's a series of, uh, I call these leapfrogs. I mean, these are leapfrogs to what Sony has. And I think that's what's going to make the product so successful. But if there if there's is leapfrogging, when I, when I hear you say that, I think, you know, the, I think it's like a restaurant, right? I could see... Mm -hmm. Like in the restaurateur industry, you know, there's competition like, hey, I'm going to put out a new dish and I'm going to get more customers at my restaurant next week. And then you had at your restaurant with with hardware cameras, for example, it's different, right? Because you buy in. It's a huge investment to buy into a body and the lenses and the ecosystem. And it becomes like flypaper or Stockholm syndrome. Once you're in it, you're in it. So when well, for the most part, you can break free and go switch. Obviously. Mm -hmm. But it's not as easy as just making the decision to go to the restaurant next door versus this one. But when you say leapfrog, I wonder, you know, who, when, if, if let's say Lumix and Panasonic introduces a superior, let's say the, the, new, the new cameras that are coming out are superior to the A7 series that are out there now. Mm -hmm. Are they superior enough? And is Panasonic's marketing strong enough to create enough gravity to pull people away from other brands into the Lumix brand, or is Panasonic sort of relegated to pulling in, I'm using astrophysics metaphors, but you know, relegated to pulling in loose asteroids that are that haven't found an orbit yet. You know, what Don, oh. Don, you're 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 the, the science geek here. What do you think? <laughs> well, I mean there's a couple of things that play in Panasonic's favor, and it all goes back to this relationship with their partners too, because Sigma also announced that they're gonna do a, a mount conversion uh, service. So mm -hmm. if you have an existing uh, Sigma lens for a different mount, and I'm sure that there will be limited limitations on what mounts will uh, will be available for the service, you can convert that to the L mount. And I was just shocked because I, I thought that wouldn't be even feasible for a company to offer, but they're putting a lot of muscle in that. So if you have existing lenses, you can get them natively compatible to this new system. Now, Panasonic has also stated um, uh, very vaguely that by the, the Tokyo Olympics, that they will have an 8K capable camera. And mm -hmm. so that just kind of put a marker in the future to say, okay, well, we're creating this now, but we're not stopping here. We're not dipping our toe in the water and see what's going to come of that. Mm -hmm. We have plans. There is a roadmap, and, and we're not necessarily privy to that roadmap. But by, by planting that one little seed, you know that if you invest into the system now, then it will carry you forward um, you know, uh, quite some distance. But the interesting thing is, if you are an existing Canon or Nikon shooter, you're going to have to either adapt your lenses or switch into a totally new system. And when Canon first came out with their uh, uh, the EOS R, they put out a 40-page white paper that I read, um, and it was it was interesting because they didn't I didn't have to read between the lines on that. They listed uh, in uh, point form all of the points of failure of the EF system that cannot be overcome by re-engineering that system, Ooh. but by having to reimagine it. And all of the things that once you can reimagine it, all of these other possibilities come in as well. And so that just puts the writing on the wall for any cannon shooter, <laughs> that if you're going to be jumping into the EOS R, then you're going to have to jump into a totally new system. Yeah. But where is brand loyalty then at that point? Because if Canon is kind of abandoning you to some degree, uh, then will you stick with them? I mean, maybe. But if there are better offerings that are knocking on your door and saying, hey, you know what? Uh, and Sigma, of course, is, uh, again, I think it's the linchpin in all of this in terms of compatibility and lenses. If you're a Sony shooter, if you're a Canon shooter, Nikon, Sigma's made lenses and understands the autofocus and the communication systems of all of these lenses. And they've said that they're going to 
make as many adapters as they can to bring that all the way in. So from that perspective, you're not abandoning anything when you jump into this new ecosystem. Everything, so long as you were a full frame shooter, is going to come along with you. Yeah. Well, let, let's mm -hmm. zoom out a little bit, right? So, you know, part of this, and, and like I said before, you all three of us are sort of marinating in, in this world, but most consumers, I would argue, are not. You know, they're just, if, if they're, if they're, looking or they've been sitting on the sidelines and looking to get a, a nice semi-pro professional system, if, if, if it were me, I would be overwhelmed with analysis paralysis right now with all the choices that are out there. If you're, if you got old, you're like, oh, I love this photography thing. I want to get into it. And all I have is this old, you know, film camera stuff in the closet. And I want to get into the, the new state of the art mirrorless stuff that everyone's raving about. And you start studying up. How do you how do you make a choice? Like you know, you've got the Lumix, you've got all these different brands that are all saying that they're better than the other one. How do you make a choice on which one to go with? Well, I think you know Don said something very interesting, which is really a very valid point, and that is that Canon basically have come around to a fact, and that's reality. If you don't go to the Canon R system, the EOS R, the EOS previous as known, with all of the glass, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is fundamentally flawed and thereby will die. Yeah. How long will it take for it to die? I don't know. But there are two kinds of death taking place. One is the fact that it's not mirrorless, and the other is that it is it's basically got some fundamental flaws. So if you're switching, if you're going to switch from where you are today as a loyal Canon person mm -hmm. to something that's going to give you the same uh, image quality, the same sensor size, et cetera, et cetera, you have basically two choices. Move to the R system and hope for the best because you are really hoping for the best. I mean, there's 10 years of technology that Panasonic has under their belt for mirrorless. And Canon has a few years. I don't know how many. They may have had 10 years, too, but I don't know. They haven't shown it. This is the first time they've come out with something that's viable. They came out with you know, a previous product that was that died, basically, the day it was announced. So, so if, you're, if you're a shooter looking to switch, where are you going? You're either going to Sony or Panasonic. Those are the two choices. Now, splitting the pie in two pieces, where the majority today may look like Sony, but tomorrow, when the S series comes out with all of its feature functionality, and we don't even know all the specs right now. Yeah. I mean, the specs could be far better than what we've seen. Sure. So I think people are going to wait till the product is actually fully announced before they start jumping. Uh, you don't want to jump to such a large investment and and not be sure of what you're doing. So I think that there's going to be a little bit of a wait. And it, in fact, it may in fact show, even the Sony announced, uh, you know, definitely a very profitable quarter, 5% uh, increase is big for them. Yes. Um, who knows what the next quarter is going to be like? If it's stagnant, then you know what people are doing. You know what they're thinking. Sure. Nikon, on the other hand, uh, who knows what them? I mean, they've, they've come out with a product that at least has been accepted by their base, but it has other big issues. So who knows? Yeah. I'm not worried about Nikon space so much. It's, yeah. It's yeah. The whole space is, is eating up or, or heating up. Don, Don Komareska, what, what do you say? Like the advice that you give to people, like I was saying, they've got, they've got their old DSLR or their old SLR in the closet and they want to move from film to digital and they, they're overwhelmed by the choice. What what would be your 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 advice? You're having coffee with this person, and they ask you the question: Which one should I? Where should I go, Don? There's so much stuff out there. What do you tell them? Well, if you're coming from the film era, for one, I mean, you're playing the long game for sure. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> 
So, uh, but but if we continue along that long game analogy, uh, you look at what Sony's doing with their E-mount. And I saw a, a really fun article recently that compared the actual diameters of all of these mounts. And the E-mount was surprisingly tiny. Uh, and I think Sony really had to do some engineering miracles to get a full frame camera sensor inside of that because the corners of the sensor are actually pretty much hitting the edge of the lens mount. Wow. Um, and that might limit some of your lens mount designs um comparatively and this was unusual uh, uh shiv uh mentioned the canon eos m you didn't mention it by name but um it's kind of on life support right now um, it actually has a mount diameter that is one millimeter larger than the sony e-mount and mm -hmm. canon is only ever producing aps-c sensors within that so if you have a larger mount and then you have more flexibility in how you design your optics without compromising them based on, uh, you know, the flange distance, which has been a big issue on the flapping mirror cameras for the longest time. And when that goes away, uh, you can make a lens um, at the same engineering cost much better or at a lesser cost equally to what we're currently used to. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a huge advantage moving forward is that the optics for the same dollar value are going to get better. Or if you're looking at what we have today, it just gets cheaper uh, in terms of what we can create. So um, if you look forward, a larger lens mount, I think, is better. And that's where I'm looking at uh, Canon and Panasonic. Uh, I think Canon has the biggest. But when you get so big at a certain point and that rear element has to be much larger, it also changes the way you design optics. And there's it's not a bigger is better scenario. There is a sweet spot. Uh, and I think that's why Panasonic teamed up with Leica when they saw their L mount. Instead of reinventing the wheel, they said, this is it. I mean, th this is uh, as close as we're going to get to the, the perfect mount. So we're jumping on board. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to switch gears yet again and and bring us back out of the, the gears and, and widgets cloud into more of the artistic side of things. So but I'm going to I'm going to weave it in there cleverly. So we've got like I was saying, we've got sort of a, a universe or a solar system of of um, gear and choices to choose from. And one of the interviews I did uh, just yesterday with Joe Edelman from, you know, he's an Olympus shooter. Um, and, and part of the discussion was, was how gear can sort of obfuscate the, the idea of creating art. In fact, he went so far as to say that he coined the term <coughs> geartographer. Right. <laughs> Where and that's a person that is more obsessed with acquiring the latest and best gear and talking about it than actually making photographs with the with that amazing gear that they have. So in that in, under that umbrella, how what's the advice that you guys give to and, you know, you know, we'll throw it to you, Shiv, first. What's the advice that you give to a person that is saying, hey, you know, uh, I'm an artist. I want to buy this new system, but I'm I'm sort of getting confused and distracted by all this cool stuff that's out there. How do you get them to focus on just you know being an artist and looking at the hardware as a tool versus as an object of desire, like you know the Ring and Lord of the Rings? I'm going to say something which probably won't go down well with a lot of people. <laughs> Right. I mean, if you have, you know, just gear acquisition, gas, just, <laughs> that's it, right? Gas. Then you're not an artist. <laughs> yes. Then you're not an artist because all you're interested in doing is, is buying gear uh, and hoping that the gear is going to do your art for you. Mm -hmm. Art is you. Art is not the camera. Art is not the lenses. I mean, they help. Uh, the, the best artist, you know, does he need to use a brush? No, he can use his fingers and create art. So you don't even have to have an external tool if you are truly an artist. And I feel exactly the same way as far as cameras are concerned. These are tools. They assist you in doing what it is that you want to do. If you believe you're an artist, then don't worry about what gear you buy. Yeah. It'll do it for you. So I agree. I agree. But, you know, at the same time, and Don, I'll let you answer this as well. At the same time, you know, I, I'm not saying that I'm on some cloud and don't have any of that gear, that gear acquisition syndrome. I get as like, you know, you, you start having the reality distortion field and the, well, let me see how much money I can, you know, I can squeeze that out of my bank account when you see these new camera bodies and new lenses and all that stuff show up. 
Don, how do you, how do you manage that? And I, I, I give this question to both of you guys because you're both accomplished artists, right? And you're not, you're not gear photographers. You're not looking for, you know, you're, you don't do it in reverse where you're like, hey, I'm going to buy this piece of gear and then figure out how I can make stuff with it. It's, I have a problem I need to solve. It's really, both of you guys, I have a problem I need to solve, snowflakes or whatever, and I need a piece of gear that can do that for me. Let me go get that so I can execute what's in my mind's eye. Don Comoresco, what do, you, what do you say to the whole gear versus art argument? That is such a gray line. And, and I'm going to give a couple of analogies here. Uh, my wife and I were recently in uh, Vienna, and we went into one of their art museums, and we saw um, Klimt's The Kiss. And Gustav Klimt, uh, if you're not familiar with his work, look up The Kiss, a wonderful painting using metal, uh, golds and silvers and platinums and what have you. And it's a signature piece of his. But when you see it, it's massive. Uh, it would not have had the similar impact on me if it was the size of the Mona Lisa, which I think is overhyped. But um, from the art world, I mean, because it was so big and you could nose up to it and see so much detail, there was value in that. And the fact that he decided to paint it big was valuable. But, you know, if you make art on any scale, any size, any resolution, so long as it's good art, it will survive. You look at all of the images made on 35 millimeter film that are iconic. You know, if I say Tank Man to you, you can picture it. If I say Napalm mm -hmm. Girl, you can picture it. I mean, these are images that were made in the era of film that are iconic and award-winning, and they're made on what we consider antiques today. Yeah. But I still have gear acquisition syndrome. Yeah. Because, you know, like even sitting on my desk here, I've got a Metabone speed booster adapter <laughs> that I'll be using this winter yeah. to put my Canon MPE 65 millimeter super macro lens onto uh, a, a GX9 or a G9 uh, Micro Four Thirds camera, and I'm going to shoot snowflakes with that because that's going to be fun. Uh, but I'm combining gear together. I've made very successful images on what would be considered antiquated lenses. You know, as uh, you know, as Shiv mentioned the uh, uh, the Meyer optic lenses. I've got their Trio Plan 100, and the the standard triplet design is necessarily flawed, um, but that can create some interesting bokeh in the background, and you can use that to artistic effect. It doesn't need to be pixel perfect. You've got to understand what tools you have and how to make the most of them. And if you think that your tools are limited, you are most likely wrong. Um, there are some exceptions if you're really pushing the limits of physics and science and technology. But if you're pushing the limits of artistry, you can do that with what you have right now. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said. Very well said. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the other piece of this is, you know, we, we could talk ad nauseum about, so, you know, art versus hardware, gear acquisition syndrome, gear photography. Um, uh, but I want to, I want to switch gears yet again and talk about gear. Right? So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is what the show is so about. Come back to reality. The show is about gear. So I want to talk yes. about, it. uh, but from the, from, uh, from both of your standpoints, you guys approach photography from two different vectors, right? So from the standpoint of what's missing in the gear that you currently own, like what are the features? If you're going to write a love letter or an open letter to the the powers that be, Shiv, we'll start with you. Don, you can start formulating your answer. Uh, Shiv, the, the powers that be at Panasonic and you say, you know, I love everything about this system, but I need this thing right here in order to push my work to the next level. What's missing? What do you need in the in the camera system that's not present today? You know, it's 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 a very difficult question because yes. I want to play some Jeopardy music. Technology <laughs> technology has reached a point where uh, there's not a whole lot more that one needs or one requires, mm -hmm. you know, when it comes to photography. Uh, you're always looking for, you know, will I have edge-to-edge -edge sharpness? Will I have this? Will I have that? Or can I get this? But, you know, there are ways around it. So if it's going to be a piece of technology that is going to take the price point above and beyond what you will then be able to afford, why ask for it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, what Google tried to do with Google Glass. <laughs> yep. yeah. Wear it and take it, you know. I mean, just, just do it. Maybe technology could get to that point. But then what am I doing? If my eyes see something and I can say, well, take a picture and make it look like exactly what I want it to be, then what have I achieved? Sure. So I, I don't want to get to a point where 
the artist in me, as I say, has no value left because my brain can do the photography. I think that might so, be inevitable, though. I mean, we're heading in that direction with all this. Well, yes, we are. But you know, we, computational photography augmented this. It's it's coming fast, and we're only in 2018. Imagine 2025, where yeah. things are going to be. Right. I mean, du dual lens, three dimensional photography. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's something that would be interesting. But is there a market for it? There are very few people. Don may do it. I may do it. Mm -hmm. But. You know, will everybody do it? No. Should should a product be made for it? They tried. There have been so many cameras made for 3D, and what happened? You know, one model comes out, it's done. It's over. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Don Komersko, what about you? I mean, you, what's what's missing from the, the current lineup or what you know about what's coming that's public that you need that is not there, that you want Panasonic to build for you? Okay, well, uh, on Shiv's comment, if anybody listening to this is the owner of a Leica Steemar 3D lens from 1954 to 1957, I'm trying to find a copy of that lens that has no fog or fungus on it, which I can mount to a Panasonic S-series camera and shoot some really fun 3D work and no good full-frame regular uh, 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 stereoscopic 3D camera has been made since the 1950s, and I need to get one of these. These things. So anybody out there listening, <laughs> please contact price, me. At any price, right? <laughs> well, not any price. I mean, I'm going to be reasonable here, but uh, I will pay what it's worth. The, the, the thing that, going on to that, though, is like in a general sense, um, I have never owned a camera that has had pixel shift resolution increasing technology. I shoot with the Lumix GX9, which does not have that feature. Frederick, you have that in the G9, and uh, and uh, I, I I would like that to be something to move forward with. The technology is there, and and uh, if I'm doing a still life subject, would I want more resolution when it's just built into the camera? Well, absolutely I would. Um, I don't know what I would necessarily do with it, but to have it is always an asset because I'm doing an art show. Uh, I'm, I'm actually preparing and planning for it right now in one of my local museums. And I'm going to be printing a bunch of 40 by 40 inch uh, you know, prints. Now, I would want them to be nosed right up to and not see any degradation in quality. But at 20 megapixels, I'm not going to get that. And that's what I'm shooting with right now. Mm -hmm. So in some, I, the majority of images that I share, they're going to be online. They're going to be on Facebook or Flickr or elsewhere. And resolution does not matter at all there. But in the fringes, if you're trying to do some of those extreme things, resolution most certainly does. Um, I I like a, a, a rate of fire that is very fast. I like a dynamic range that is very good. Um, but I'm I mean, there's a lot of limiting factors on all of those. Dynamic range is only as good as you know how to get it out of the file sure. because you still have to edit the image afterwards mm -hmm. to your taste. Um, and a rate of fire, if I'm shooting macro work, well, uh, as fast as my camera, like I, I was shooting with the Canon 1DX Mark II for many years, and it can shoot at 14 frames per second. Never used it at that speed because my flash could never keep up with me, <laughs> yeah. right? So, I mean, there's limitations all over the place um, that we're always trying to push into. And I, in fact, I just found, um, uh, was it Bolt, one of the third-party manufacturers for flash accessories and things, has a battery pack that I can attach to my ring flash that instead of having eight batteries has 12. So now I can be firing whole hog with 16 batteries, including the four in the flash, to maybe eke that up a little bit. I don't know. I haven't tested it yet, but I sure as heck bought it because it could potentially increase my performance in that area. Will it make me a better photographer than I was last year? No, it won't, right. because the better photographer comes from the ideas that you have, not necessarily the equipment. But will it be a little bit more polished and have a little bit more flexibility in the terms of what you output down the road? Yeah, and I want that flexibility. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, that's it. I mean, what I'm hearing from both of you guys is it doesn't seem like that. The, it seems like camera bodies – and you can look at the lineup of, of across manufacturers of what cameras are looking like. And then for the most part, they look pretty similar, right? It's almost like cars. You can get in one car and then jump to a different brand and drive it successfully. Um, but it, it sounds like the feature set on the bodies themselves and, and the overall features are great. And what I'm hearing from both of you is image quality, dynamic range, those sorts of things are where you'd like to see performances or, or improvements in. Is that fair? 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think what Don said is, you know, important because if all you're doing is showing your images online or you're, you know, showing limited resolution, that doesn't really matter. Uh, any camera is good enough. Yeah. But if you go into the print world and if you're making really large prints, then yes, resolution starts playing a role into it. I mean, software algorithms exist that can allow you to build up and build pixels to make large. But, you know, in reality, you want it native. You want it native, the native pixel to be sized enough to do that. Right. And getting back to the gear aspect of it, just imagine, okay, if, if Panasonic was able to do what they were able to do with the G9, to actually do pixel shifting, and to be able to produce in camera an image that you can now process in Lightroom or whatever, whereas with the Sony system, you need other software and it doesn't work too well. Um, think about it with a 47 megapixel full frame sensor, Yeah. right? Yeah. Now, it's got image stabilization, which means it can shift. And if it can shift, if they do pixel shift in that camera, what kind of image will you get? Just think about that. Yeah. I mean, this could be huge. Yeah. I mean, if, if just basically 45 times four, that might be the resolution. Yeah. And it's like I said, it's 2018, right? So there's yeah. there's there's a lot of room for improvement in, in all this stuff. So let, let's 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 start wrapping things up. I want to I want to talk a little bit about the industry and wrap, bring it full circle. And like I said, there's there's you know I could I could read down the list right of the different camera manufacturers out there. Do you guys think that we like is it is it time for a coalescing and sort of a sort of a, a an evolution of the industry where some brands get absorbed into other brands and some brands go away completely and you know and we end up with you know just a few strong players in there Don Don Kamerska what do you think is it is it time for the you know, for the quickening you know, of, the, <laughs> of the photography space? That's a really hard question to answer. I mean, every camera manufacturer is making good cameras. I don't think anybody would question that. Unless you bought the Yashica Y35, you probably bought a good camera. Uh, and so when we look at the industry as a whole, it all happens to be how many photographers are out there that are buying them. Be a lot of people might be transitioning towards a cell phone. You know, the, the, the new iPhones are exceptional right out of the gate yeah. to get a very passable photo for a lot of people. And so there's a certain part of the market share that is going in that direction because they don't care about all of the bells and whistles and the spec sheets that we all drool over here as photographers listening to this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, but of those that are here, is that number growing or shrinking? And I, I'd like to think that it is staying about stable. Um, and there's different markets for it. As we established for Micro Four Thirds, it's a different market than a full frame and a medium format camera, et cetera. Uh, and there's film that's you know still coming back. I mean, Kodak has just reintroduced the Ektar 100 film. And yes, I bought a couple of rolls of that. Or not Ektar, Ekt Chrome, sorry. And uh, I hope I'll be able to shoot it before it expires. When does it expire? Sometime in 2020. That's hit or miss. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm it. Camera <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll take it in the refrigerator, man. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but but you, you look at where the industry is going and how these different segments are are being associated. Uh, I think that there is enough room for all of the current players to stay in the game, and I think that's a really valuable thing because the more competition you have as a consumer, the better it is for you. Yeah. Because all of these people are going to try to put out and put that little bit of extra research and development into making their product better than the competition. The less competition you have, the less effort people put into beating the competition. And so the more players, the better for me. Yeah, absolutely. Shiv Verma, what about you? You, do you, you think it's time for the purge or, or the more the merrier? Well, I, I, I don't think it's time for the purge yet. I think we need to, we need to have this competition. Uh, it needs to be uh, you know, I mean, competition does a bunch of things. It forces people to innovate. And that is what we're always looking for. And if we, as long as innovation continues, uh, competition is a good thing. When it stops, then who cares? Then you've just got you know, a product and you've done it. 35 millimeter film cameras became that way. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why you got to a point where you bought one and you kept it for 10 years. Yeah. 
You know, which camera do you keep for 10 years? I mean, whether it's, it's and it isn't even the gas part of it. It's just the fact that these cameras will go obsolete. Yeah. And uh, you know, won't do what you want it to do. And there, there are things that, you know, even though I didn't answer the question in its entirety before, there are things that we're looking for. I mean, Don brings up a good point. I'd like a camera to be able to fire its flash at the same rate as the sensor can be fired. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's that's something. I mean, how about 60 frames a second? So fire my fra flash at the same rate. Uh, technology could potentially do that at some point, but then you know somebody will come around and say, "Well, put put a static, you know, always on light and do it." Yeah, well, um, right. But it doesn't have the power. So you know, it's it's stuff like that. I mean, we're going to continue to innovate for a considerable number of years, and as long as that's in play competition's good keep it there yeah no i agree you know maybe somebody dies but who cares nikon might die canon might die yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well that's evolution right so yeah yeah yeah, we that, it. yeah that's good that that's thinning thinning the herd so that the strongest can survive i think that, that's awesome and i think um you know, as as consumers, you know, you 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 bring up a good point, Shiv. As we look at this stuff, it used to be back in the day that it was you're right. You know, every couple of years or so, we would upgrade our cameras or whatever. But most of the important hardware, all the hardware I have, I, I guess, is important. But most of my most used hardware, i.e., my computer, my cameras, my phone, my tablet, those things feel like they're on a subscription plan. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it yeah. feels yeah. like they're on a subscription yeah. planned obsolescence upgrade path. And I know within 18 months to two years, I'm going to get rid of it and it's going to pa be passed either into the family or it's going to go somewhere else. And, you know, we'll, we'll have a new piece of gear there. So well, but there's another thing that hasn't happened in the camera industry, uh, which might happen. So they, they come up with a firmware type of upgrade, which basically enhances performance, capabilities, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And just like Apple did, if your product is three years old, I'm sorry, this is not going to work on it. Yeah, right. So now you're going to be forced into, you know, using the newer product line because the older product line just can't do it. Yeah. What's worse is that now try selling that thing. Yeah. Nobody's going to buy it. No one's going to buy it. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I'll answer my own question because I asked, I asked the question before about what's missing from, from cameras or from Lumix or whatever that you'd want to have added in. So my request would be to have an app ecosystem and uh, always on cellular technology built into my camera, kind of like mm -hmm. my phone and my tablet, right? So... I want to be able to say, you know what? Kind of like Sony did this with they they tried it. Well, Panasonic did that. They, they had did the it, but they had an, it was an Android based or something. I, I want something stronger, and I wanted Panasonic. You know? Are you saying Android is not strong? Um, <laughs> uh oh. I'm saying I prefer my iOS devices. That's what. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, I don't know Android, like an, so I don't know. Always on iOS-driven camera. Right, but wouldn't it be cool to be able to say to look on the back of your screen because we all have screens and say, you know, go in and say, hey, I want to do this intervalometer. I need an intervalometer that can do X, X, Y, and Z. Download it from a robust app ecosystem that is hosted by Panasonic and vetted by Panasonic, download it and run with it. Wouldn't that be cool? You could have everything that we want as photographers is what's coming out because we already have everything that we need. The wants are what drives the entire industry. Right. Yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Yeah, that's all. And, and many things in life, I guess. is <laughs> uh, Everything connected is through one place and it's shivverma.com www.shivverma.com just go there and have fun awesome and shiv thank you for coming on man i appreciate it it's always a pleasure to well, thank you thank you awesome awesome don komarechka man what about you if people want to get into the world of don com where do they go well, much the same way, everything is linked to from one primary source, doncom.ca, D-O-N-K-O-M.ca. Got a bunch of macro photography workshops coming up in 2019 and an Iceland tour about a year from now in October 2019 that will be a lot of fun. You can find all of that at that website. And of course, as we mentioned earlier, photogeekweekly.com. It would be great to have anybody listening to this. Check that out as well.
This is Twitter.